I'd like to talk today about a new paper that we've produced on online interpolation point refinements for basically reduced order modeling using a genetic algorithm. This is work with Susie Sargassian, who is finishing her PhD this summer in applied mathematics here at the University of Washington, along with Steve Brunton, who is in the mechanical engineering department at the University of Washington, and I'm Nathan Kutz, uh, a professor here in applied mathematics at the University of Washington. So, what I really want to be start thinking about is the idea of model reduction and some of the innovations around model reduction, and some of these are fairly standard, and so I'll highlight them here and then talk about this idea of how we might be able to improve some of the sparse sampling strategies that are used uh, to do interpolation of the nonlinear terms in reduced order models. So we typically think about a nonlinear dynamical system of this form for reduced order modeling, where you have some time dynamics of some vector u. Typically, this may be a discretization of some large PDE or some very uh, network dynamical system of some sort. You have some nonlinear evolution dynamics and a nonlinearity. You, of course, have boundary conditions and initial conditions as well that go along with this. So part of our objective is to figure out how to actually solve this in a more efficient manner, especially if the state space U is extremely large. So these very high dimensional systems requiring large computations, can we in fact reduce the computation time significantly? The biggest trouble is the nonlinearity. If we just had a linear term, this would be a trivial task, but the nonlinearity really complicates evolving this forward in time. And I'll show you why in a moment. So first, let's figure out how to actually project the dynamics onto some low dimensional subspace. One way to do this is to think about collecting snapshots of this evolution dynamics. Now this can be done, so you're going to have to do some high fidelity coding, which is going to be solve this large scale systems for at least a little while to generate sample snapshots out of this dynamical system. So U1 is at time, let's say, T1, and then time T2 all the way to time T of M. And you build this large uh, data matrix of snapshots of the system, and this is this matrix X. And what we want to look at here is what are the low rank structures in this data matrix X. And sort of the standard way to do that is with a singular value decomposition. So we're going to take this data matrix of snapshots and decompose it into the singular value components, which are U, sigma, and V star. So your data matrix looks like this uh, philosophically in some ways, where you have the U matrix, which contains the modal structures that dominate the dynamics, arranged in orthogonal columns. The singular values are along this diagonal of this matrix. The sigma matrix is a diagonal matrix, which tell you essentially a score or a weighting of each of the individual uh, U vectors here. So with the largest first to the smallest, and the idea is that, that you hope that there's some kind of low rank structure in here, and it'll, this singular value matrix will tell you where to truncate. And the V is the time dynamics associated with these modes. So often these modes here in this matrix U are called POD modes, or proper orthogonal decomposition, because it gives you a set of low rank structures you, that are orthogonal modes that you can work with now to project or embed your dynamics in. Uh, low rank truncation is really the heart of this, which is if you just kept all those modes, you would have not really gained anything. However, if we see some low dimensional structure in our simulation, which is typically the case for large scale PDEs, then we can do some truncation of the singular values, keep a certain prescribed number of modes, let's say R, and then keep R columns of the U matrix, the first R, which are an orthogonal set of modes that we call phi of R. And these, P of, these POD modes that we keep represent where we want to project our nonlinear dynamics onto. Okay? So we want to go from a high dimensional space down to a low dimensional subspace by truncating with these, with these uh, eigenvalues or eigenvectors here. So the way we actually make this projection happen is through a Galerican projection, which is to say my state space U, I'm going to do an expansion of this thing in my basis. And so now, all the time dynamics it sits here in the vector A. Each component of the vector A tells me about the evolution of the system along a, one of these columns of phi of R. Okay? The important thing to know about phi of R is that they're orthogonal columns 
So this inner product here holds. If you take an inner product of the phi of r transpose with phi of r, it's the identity. It just tells you that every single column of phi of r is orthogonal and of unit length. So we want to do this projection. We're going to assume our solution is of this form. And by the way, uh, a thing to notice about this solution form, it's intrinsically or explicitly assuming that you have sort of a, uh, a separation of variables. So all the spatial dependence is picked up here in the phi of r. The time dependence is picked up in the vector a of t. So when you throw that back into the original nonlinear dynamical system, what you end up getting is, is a low dimensional dynamical system for the vector a of t. So here's the time evolution of the, vector, of the coefficients of those POD modes. It's given by this term here, which is the time derivative, times what happens with the linear portion of the evolution. Now notice that with the linear evolution, you could pre-compute this entire uh, three uh, matrix sequence, which is inverse of uh, transpose of phi of r times L times phi of r. This is just a linear operator. So this whole thing can be pre-computed once in your computation. And at that point, you have something very simple to work with, which is an r by r matrix to multiply by this vector a. So this is trivial. What is hard is over here, because as you update your solution, the nonlinearity must be updated. And this inner product has to be done over and over again in a very large dimensional space. So even though you've tried to project into a low dimensional space, that nonlinear term would force you to continue to compute products in the high dimensional, inner products in the high dimensional space. So that is, in fact, uh, where much of our problem lies in figuring out how to uh, evaluate them in an easy way. So let me just exemplify this with a very simple example. So let's just take something like a cubic term, u cubed. So there it is. Let's suppose my nonlinearity was of that form. Uh, and I'm going to just do a two-mode expansion. I'm going to assume that, in fact, I have just two POD modes. And I just want to ask, what happens if I have two POD modes? What's the complication it produces with something as a simple nonlinearity as this form? Well, if you put the two-mode expansion in, here it is, a1 times mode 1, a2 times mode 2. And then the inner products, just taking this through the cubic, generates quite a few number of terms. And each one of these you've got to take an inner product of, and each one of these you have to take an inner product as you update the, the, a, the values of A, you have to redo these inner products. So this is where the problem lies, is that this thing here can get out of hand very quickly. It can become very large, especially if you take uh, a much larger expansion than two modes and more complicated nonlinearities. But of course, this has been a problem for quite a while, and so people have figured out how to think about dealing with this. So just to, just to recap, I'm going to, in fact, frame this in the sense that there's really two big innovations in reduced order modeling. The first is what we've talked about here, which is take your nonlinear dynamical system, snapshots of the matrix, find the low dimensional embedding, which is given here. In other words, do a low rank truncation. So that's the first innovation, is that you take, by taking these snapshots, you can find this low dimensional structure that you're looking for. And then you can project onto some dynamical system. That's only one of the major innovations in reduced order modeling. The second major innovation is in how to evaluate that nonlinear term, which will come through this idea of gappy uh, POD, or in other words, you sparsely sample to do nonlinear interpolation on that function. Okay, so there's those are the two pillars of being able to really carry forward the agenda of the reduced order modeling. So let's talk about this idea of sparse sampling. It's an old idea in some sense, which is it goes back all the way to the work of Soro Sorovich and Everson, where they looked at gappy sampling to reconstruct uh, in an L2 way. Uh, you know, they, they took uh, pictures, and they were able to reconstruct eigenface pictures with a small sampling of the pictures. Uh, after that, you led this idea led to this gappy POD method that Karen Wilcox developed, which basically started for the first time thinking about smartly selecting where we should sample in order to minimize, in that case, it was the condition number. And since that point, people have been really interested in figuring out uh, principled ways to select how to sparsely sample to reconstruct the dynamics. So let me just give you uh, one that's more uh, recent innovation is on the idea of compressive sensing. And this idea is really very closely related, which is 
Uh, this is from a cartoon from Richard Baruniak uh, in a review article on, on, on compressive sensing, which is if I know I have some kind of low rank basis in which the dynamic sits, which would be this matrix phi, and I know how to sample on it, here's my sampling matrix phi, then what I want to do is have some kind of sparse representation of that solution. Suppose I believe, in fact, that given some basis set that my signal or my data is actually sparsely represented in that, then what I would like to do is set up the basis, the sampling, and take small number of measurements, and this gets us to our, the idea of sparsely sampling. And what I could do then is decide which of the small number of coefficients actually represent my signal of interest. And the way this is set up, this is just a big AX equal to B problem. But now, instead of looking for a solution, which is the best L2 norm for the solution, I look for the one with the best L1 norm. And by doing this L1 norm minimization, what I find is the sparsest solution set. And that allows me then to take a small number of measurements and reconstruct the entire state space of the system. So this has gained a lot of traction recently in the literature for a variety of reasons in signal processing, image reconstruction, medical imaging. We use this, and this is going to build towards what we want to talk about here, to do sparse sampling for fluids. And this is work with Ido Bright, Guang Lin, where we started thinking about, well, how do we use this kind of architecture, let's say, with a small number of samples on around that cylinder? And I want to do a three, few tasks. I want to be able to take a small number of measurements on the cylinder of the pressure. I want to be able to tell you what the Reynolds number is. I would like to reconstruct the pressure field around the cylinder and in the flow field, and then maybe even give you a future state prediction. And the architecture is based partly on this idea of compressive sensing, which is what we do is we do two steps in this process. And it's very much around a machine learning ideas, which is first, you sample your data. And in fact, we're going to sample our data at various Reynolds numbers, and we're going to build POD libraries representing these different dynamical states. So you do your data sampling, you find your low rank truncation of this specific data, suppose this is for Reynolds number 100, and you keep those POD modes in some library. And then you do this again for different dynamical regimes, Reynolds number 40, 100, 300, so forth. So this is what's often called in, in the machine learning literature, this is sort of your, your, uh, your training phase of the algorithm. And then the execution phase is, is a little bit different. The execution phase assumes that you've built this library so that you know what the load dimensional embeddings look like. And so what we want to do is just take a small number of sensors, here they are, and use this compressive sensing algorithm to help us identify which of these libraries we should be using. So we basically now, in this case, unlike typical compressive sensing, here we're going to use point measurements for the dynamics. So we don't, oftentimes in compressive sensing, they take random projections. Here we take point measurements because that's more physically realistic around this flow around the cylinder. We take these measurements and we solve this AX equal B problem. And only a few coefficients come on, which should be the case because generically the fluid should be in only one of the dynamical regimes. And we can look at the modes that come on and be able to say, identify which Reynolds number it's at, and then do a reconstruction of the dynamics. So we want to use that here. And we can see that, in fact, as the Reynolds number is increased, we do actually a very good job at uh, pretty often accurately predicting the Reynolds number and also reconstructing the full fl fluid flow. Now what's not addressed in this kind of architecture is the idea of where do we put this the sensors. What we did is we, we had some idea of that we might want to put sensors around where the largest uh, uh, variable variability happens. In other words, where the minimum and maximum POD, POD modes occur. So this is what we did to do, make this work. But what we'd really like to do is find a more optimal way to do this. And in fact, obviously what we did here was not optimal. However, we'd like to figure out, is there a way to enact an algorithm to go find an optimal location? So part of the work towards doing this was also done with Susie Sargassian and Steve Brutton. And this is a paper in Physical Review E, where we basically started looking at a, a methodology for determining how to optimize sensor locations. Okay? And so, and, and, and again, with the goal of reconstructing of dynamics and doing nonlinear interpolation of those reduced order for those new, reduced order models. 
So we normally would take a nonlinear dynamical system, we collect data in different dynamical regimes, okay, and here there's from beta 1 regime, beta 2 regime, all the way to beta j. Uh, and so we would say, let's look at all the dynamical regimes we can. For each given regime, I am going to do uh, a POD reduction. But more than just a POD reduction, I'm going to look at a POD reduction of the modes, but also of the nonlinear terms. So I'm going to take the nonlinearity, do reductions of the nonlinearity. And this is very so closely associated with the uh, discrete emp empirical interpolation method. Uh, that is going to be the basis of what we do here. So we construct all of these, each of them telling me, the D, this DIMES algorithm is a greedy search algorithm, telling me fairly good sensing locations. And so I construct all these and take sort of some average of where all these library modes uh, tell me where to put sensors. And then once I have that, I have sort of an optimal way then in terms of trying to figure out how to place sensors for both classifying the dynamics reconstructing the dynamics, and giving me a future state prediction. And those are all the steps here. I won't go too much into this paper. If you want to see the details of this paper, there's also a, a video abstract on my website that you can look at the details with, that Susie put together for this. And that's only one method that you might use. This, this DIMES algorithm is only one way to sort of get uh, near optimal sensor locations. It's not optimal, but it's, it does a very good job. Other possibilities are by using L1 optimization, and I'll point to this paper that will appear in SIAM, Journal of Applied Mathematics. And this actually is an optimal way to think about how to choose your sensor locations. And even as you increase the noise level in a system, you can start figuring out where I should put my sensors so that I can make optimal classification decisions about what Reynolds number I'm at. Okay? And really, part of the motivation for all of this is another paper I'll point out to you is by Krithika Manohar, Steve Brunton, and myself. It's on the archive, which is we were looking at sort of flight dynamics and how do sensors on insect wings inform flight dynamics. So we have a model around this that was inspired by biology, which tells you there's a few neurons out on that wing that act as strain sensors. And these strain sensors seem to inform the creature about its flight dynamics. And so how would you place these strain sensors because they are in fact in stereotype positions and they are sparse. And so we have an idea of how to place these so as to give maximal information content for, uh, for this insect to, to execute command decisions and so forth. Okay, so that's sort of this idea of sparse sampling and now the whole point is to integrate sparse sampling with reduced order modeling. And that's the purpose of this, which people have done for quite a while. However, we have a new innovation around how to improve our, our sampling locations. So let's recall that we want to sparsely sample. And now I'm going to introduce this matrix P, which tells me a little bit about how I'm going to sparsely sample the dynamics. So my full state is U. I multiply by P, and I get some reduced vector U tilde, which is a very small vector sampled, which is a sample of the large high dimensional space P. And P itself typically are rows of, the, uh, of some identity matrix, right? So this is telling you exactly where you're going to sample, right? When there's a one there, that means you're going to sample, and then the zeros aren't sampling anything. So the idea is that I want to use this sampling matrix where I have a small number of samples to reconstruct my full dynamics. And actually to do the nonlinear interpolation trick that we need for evaluating the nonlinear terms in the reduced order base, in the reduced basis. So the way to do this is to think about a Galerican expansion again, but now U tilde, if I just look back up here, P times U, and U itself is A times the, 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 the POD modes, but now the coefficients A that I determined for this, I'm going to call them A tilde, they're going to be different than the A's I originally started with. And the question is, how well is this going to be able to reconstruct for me even because I'm s s severely subsampling now the original dynamics. So the DIEM algorithm, the DIMES algorithm that we are using, is the one that tells me where to select these P points in the first place. So the DIEM algorithm works in the following way. You basically take snapshots of the nonlinearity. So you take the nonlinear term. So before we had taken the full state of the system, taking snapshots, found the POD basis. Now you take snapshots of just the nonlinearity. In other words, what this is here is going to give you an SVD 
of the nonlinearity. So this is the low rank space, optimal low rank space, encoding this nonlinearity. So the nonlinearity itself can be expanded in terms of these basis modes here times some coefficient c of t. So the c of t is playing the role of a of t, where a of t was for the full system, c of t tells you exactly the projection on uh, the nonlinear, in this nonlinear space, okay? The algorithm itself is outlined here. You first construct your data matrix, construct the nonlinearity of the data matrix, SVD it to look at the low rank space. And once you have this low rank space, the the interpolation indices are discovered in the following way in, some, in a greedy algorithm approach. You can look at the original paper by uh, Sorensen et al. And, uh, and, and that goes really in de detail uh, on how to compute these uh, greedy points. And it's well known that these actually work quite well. So there, it's a heavily used algorithm, the IMES and DIMES algorithm. So here is what we have then. What we're going to do now is evaluate the nonlinearity in a low rank way. That is the whole purpose of this. So now I can project all my nonlinear terms into some low dimensional space. And instead of producing inner products on very high dimensional uh, vectors, I'm producing inner products on small vectors. And that's what the whole point of this thing is, is that I can now tell you how to sample. And these are going to give me the interpolation points, so I don't have to now sample the whole high dimensional system, but I sample some low dimensional system to give me a fairly accurate prediction of what the nonlinear terms look like. So this is the second major innovation, uh, in my view, around reduced order modeling. It's not just find a low dimensional subspace to project your dynamics. It's also how do I, can I put my nonlinear term into that nonlinear dynamics without, it produ without having to do inner products of high dimensional systems. So this allows us to do this. And again, the DIMES algorithm is a very good algorithm for doing these things. However, it's not optimal. So what we want to think about doing is, how can we improve this? Because L1 optimization from compressive sensing can be a very expensive algorithm. We'd like an online refinement uh, way to do this so that we can take a sampling matrix, because the DIMES algorithm is very trivial to find where these sampling locations are, but we might want to improve them to sort of know that to get better classification and better error. So what we've done here, I'm showing you an example, is here's my sampling matrix P, and the idea is that maybe this sampling matrix, matrix comes from measurements around flow around the cylinder, so maybe this is my dynamics. I'm going to put sensors around this cylinder, and I'd like to be able to do what I did before, tell you what the Reynolds number is, reconstruct the pressure field both around the cylinder and outside the cylinder, maybe give you a future state prediction. So if I only have eight measurements, let's say, where should I put them? The DIMES algorithm will tell you where you can put eight, but it's not optimal. So what I'd like to do, and this picture sort of captures this, is use a genetic algorithm to search around that DIMES solution. So genetic algorithms typically are very expensive, but however here, all I need to do is take a solution where I'm very close to optimal and modulate it a little bit. Another wiggle the sensor locations around a little bit to see if I can in fact improve my performance. So each one of these moves a little bit to the left and to the right to see if we can in fact improve performance. So here's how the genetic algorithm works. You'd really like to minimize the error between your low rank vector and your projection onto from your high dimensional space. So you want to minimize this subject to a correct classification of the dynamics. Okay, so you're minimizing the error subject to the fact that it can still uh, classify the dynamics correctly. And the way this works is you take some candidate functions, j of guess is p of j. So you start by a uh, selection and you keep p of j, you maybe keep little p of them. So you're gonna basically do a bunch of guesses, let's say m guesses, put them all into the system. And all these m guesses are perturbations or mutations of the DIMES algorithm. You keep the first p of them and discard the worst p plus one to m of them. You take these best algorithms, you modify those through the genetic algorithm architecture. In other words, you evolve them, change them a little bit. You do this through many, several generations to hopefully converge onto a p of j that in fact is optimal and improves, and improves your performance relative to the DIMES algorithm. 
So here's the, the basic construction of the algorithm. So you construct a measurement matrix, and what we're doing for doing that is the previous work that, uh, of Sargassian, Brunton, and Kutz in PRE, and we're going to start with that as our initial uh, measurement matrix, which is not optimal, but it does a very good job. And then what we do is perturb all these measurements. We make new M new generations of this, and then we start selecting, down-selecting from there the best performers and keep going at this until, until we tell this thing to stop after some number of generations, in this case, M generations. Okay? So here's an example that we want to execute this on. I'm just going to give you one, a couple specific examples so you can see what the performance is like. This is the cubic quinta ginsburg landau equation. Here it is. And the nice thing about this equation is you modify the parameters in this equation, you can get very different behaviors. So these are our dynamical regimes. So here's the beta 1, there's the, here's three different uh, dynamical regimes that are, are of interest. Each one of them has a very low rank representation of the dynamics. For instance, this regime is really a one mode dynamics. Same thing here. This is a breather structure that has like five or six modes, uh, POD modes that would capture this dynamics. Now notice most of the dynamics centered around the origin. Uh, and it's partly because we put our computational grid and our, and our initial conditions around there. And so what I can think about doing is saying, okay, well, if I have these POD modes, let me compare them against each other. And here, in fact, are some of these POD modes just over the range from 0 to 2.5. This whole domain is from negative 20 to 20. And now I'm looking at a blow-up region right around this origin area. And each dot here is the actual discrete point used in the computation. So I'm just showing a small subset. I've used 1,024 points here. Here are, in fact, the first 33 interpolation points from the origin and to the right. So you see most of the dynamics is actually happening all in this area near the origin. So it seems that that would be a good place to put sensors. So in fact, keep this in mind, the first 1 through 33 interpolation points are basically measuring around the POD modes. And we're going to use that information because these turned out to be some of the best interpolation points available for you. Far away from this origin, there's nothing out here, so it's not a good interpolation point. All right, so the first thing we want to do is consider that restrained area from interpolation point 1 to 33. In other words, look near the origin. And what I want to do now is basically do a brute force search for the best locations giving me the smallest error. So if I take three interpolation points, where should I put them to minimize the error for the reconstruction? And so what this, and, and this is a small enough problem where we can actually do a full brute force search on all possible combinations. And in fact, here's what you're seeing. The first measurement location is here, second one is in the green, and the third is in the magenta. And this is going from the largest error to the very minimal error at the top here. And here's the error right here. So you start with a larger error, and as you come up here, the error drops down. And so your best interpolation points are represented in that top row. Okay? And these are these triplet pairs. So I have interpolation point one, two, and three. This tells me exactly where I want to be measuring. Now, interestingly enough, the dime algorithm always picks the zero point, that's the maximum of the first POD mode, plus two others, and it's actually an order of magnitude bigger error than what we're seeing here. So this is already telling you something important that you could improve your error significantly if you can get closer to these optimal points that are represented by here. And so that's partly what we're going to be after. Here's a histogram, by the way, of the distribution of where those first three sensors are. So we saw that the first sensor, or first interpolation point, was around here, second around here, and the third had a pretty big spread. Okay? And if we take uh, something like the Dimes algorithm and start with that, and we start iterating forward in time on a genetic algorithm, after a number of generations, you'll start here, and you drop right down into almost the minimal error. So just with a few generations of that genetic algorithm search, you're going to drop right into uh, much improved performance. Okay? So, and by the way, I should make a note, the magenta line is just your straight up dimes algorithm. 
and how it drops down. And the second one here is that we notice from here that the first dime location in certain examples really doesn't give us very much information. The first dimes point is just simply, remember in the, al in the dimes algorithm, it's a greedy search, but you start the whole search process by simply taking my first interpolation point is the maximum of the first POD mode, whether or not that is an important point or not. And in fact, in this case here, you find if I throw away the first dime point, start with the dime, the second dime point onwards, we call this a dime plus one. So in other words, <coughs> you never use the first point, you just use one point shifted over. Then you start here with your error, which is much closer. You almost cut the error in half just off the bat by doing this, and then you get this convergence down. Now, here is, in fact, I would say, the most important figure of the paper. And this is really sort of a head-to-head -head comparison of sort of concepts around sparse, sparse sampling. So what I'm going to give you here is a series of different techniques for how you would place the sensors and two metrics for evaluating them, both the classification, or in this case, misclassification, so you can get 100% misclassification all the way to 0%, and the error, which is large here, small here. So what you'd like to live in both of those spaces is small numbers. You want perfect classification if you can get it, and you would also like very small error. So what we're going to compare here is a bunch of gappy methods. From, in fact, starting just up here, the, la the worst one of all, which is just simply say, well, I have this large grid, 1,024 points from the simulation, pick three random points. So I never tell you where they are because these are the, we're going to have to do many trials of this, but in general, you almost always misclassify, partly because here we were looking at classifying onto three different of the dynamical regimes, and this thing here just simply always gets the wrong regime. And you don't always get very good error with this, or the errors are kind of large, and then they start dropping. Okay? Uh, so there's three or four different uh, gappy techniques, including the fact that you can minimize uh, the condition number, you can take the minimum maximum, uh, you can take a random selection of the minimum and max of the POD modes and so forth. And then we get down into this one right here, which is from these gappy methods down to the dimes algorithm. The dimes algorithm itself actually starts to do very well. This is why people have used it quite a bit, because without not a whole lot of work, the greedy algorithm already gets you pretty low error. And here's actually some of these errors here, in the di some different versions of dime. However, they don't always classify the dynamics very well. So in fact, there's a lot of misclassification error. And the point of all this is that the bottom of this thing is the optimal solution found from brute force. And next to it is our dimes algorithm with a short genetic algorithm search, which almost gets you identical results from just simply a few uh, generations of the algorithm search to refine the sampling location. In fact, you drop your error by half and your misclassification goes down by order, almost an order of magnitude by just simply executing this genetic search on top of your standard dimes algorithm. <coughs> and so that's really the power of what we're trying to introduce here is there's this a very uh, simple algorithm so that you determine where your interpolation points are and you refine them with a quick genetic search algorithm and it can actually make quite a marketed difference in both your error and your classification performance of different dynamical regimes. Here's a harder example. Uh, this is flow around a cylinder. So take Navier-Stokes, and what I've showed you here is four different representations of uh, basically POD modes, which are pressure field modes, on for different Reynolds number, from Reynolds number 40, I believe it's 150, 300, and 800. And these are your dominant low rank structures that occur for this system. The blue is the pressure field measurements, and then of course you're radially, radially around this flow around the cylinder. So you have your POD modes, and one of the questions that comes up is, well, how would I place sensors around that cylinder so that I can do these tasks of reconstruction and interpolation and so forth? Well, we applied the same algorithm there, and in this case, we took 10 measurements around the cylinder, and what I'm going to show you here is how this algorithm would act. So we're going to start off with Reynolds number 40 here. And as we move this way, this is, uh, so, so the color coding 
tells you about the time dynamics. And these overlaid rings are telling you what happens as you change the generation number. So as you come in towards this way, you can start seeing the shifts in where the sensor locations happen. So the original outside ring is what you would get from dime locations, and you move this way, this is this recursive refinement of the interpolation point, so that by the way you're, time you're on the inside, this is your optimal sensor locations or interpolation uh, locations. And this is for the different Reynolds number and how this thing evolves. So this algorithm is very nice in the sense that all it has to do is update 10 locations. And notice it's not uh, an unconstrained genetic search where it just looks everywhere. You're assuming here that you're very close to an optimal solution. So all you have to do is refine that. Okay, so often when you think about genetic algorithms, you think about these things being very expensive and not necessarily computationally efficient to find a solution to an optimum. They're used mostly when you don't have some kind of convex optimization, so you're just going to pay that price. However, here with the refinement, you can get this uh, really nice result very quickly out of the system and, and improve your error and in interpolation performance. So for instance, here with eight samples, your genetic algorithm starts here. This is where the dime locations are. And very quickly, within two generations, you've already dropped your error significantly. You can drop it a little more. And here, you're almost perfectly optimal in this case. It's harder to do a brute force search here to compare it to, because now it becomes combinatorial large. It's not as small as the complex ginsburg landau equation we looked at. But you can still see this very nice cascade down. And certainly within six generations, it's, you're not going to really improve it anymore. And here's the outline. Here is, in fact, exactly where the sensors would line up. If you were to have eight sensors and you want to know where the best locations are to do interpolation, there they are. And again, they're a modification of the Dimes algorithm. So now you really do have something that is optimal. And it came at a price, which was very uh, a low computational cost to get to it. So the highlights of this. Uh, we are using the POD type method in Galerican projection, so standard nonlinear model reduction. Um, and we're building off this idea of the dime concept and just simply integrating it with a genetic algorithm refinement. So the performance here is that you could actually do this online and get error reduction at a cheap cost computationally. So uh, I think this is a nice uh, tool for, for those who need to do nonlinear model reduction and really have to figure out ways to optimize their performance and reduce error. This gives you a path forward to doing that uh, at, at a low cost and with, the, with already this infrastructure you, you may already have into your code, you add one additional refinement step to improve your error. And in the cases we've shown here, you can in fact, like for the CQGL or flow around the cylinder, get anywhere between cutting your error in half or by an order of magnitude with just a small genetic search uh, on top of your dime. So thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this will be up on the archive and you can download it at your leisure and to look it over. Thank you very much.